is the beginning of part three. And it ain't going to be like part one and part two. This is where we're actually going to do work. Um, <clears throat> you guys got to understand that part one was me being kind of a braggadocious dick and saying I got another one of these. And that I was willing to take it on as a project. And kind of document the big problems. Part two was me showing this major repair and how I like to repair traces by building up pads and making things, you know, not just using journals. I had one guy laugh at me in the comments. He goes, man, you're so silly. Just use journals and repair it. And I'm like, eh, no, quote, eh, no. okay. <clears throat> the whole point between those first two videos was to wake up the internet. Because if you go back and you go and look at, let's say YouTube specifically, there's not been a lot of posts involving the sample fire for quite some time. And I was in a stuck position. Yes, the amplifier turned on. Yes, it technically made power, but no, it, I'm not. I had questions, like what's this all about? And uh, why is it that when it gets to 15.2 volts, it goes into overvolt protection? When according to everything I've ever read anywhere, it says it's good up to 16 volts. So my truck floats in voltage, depending on what the engine compartment temperature is from 16 volts to, you know, it's like 15.2 to 16 volts. So I had to find out there's, there was a discrepancy there. And the other major reason is I've got to repair this resistor over here that's burned up. Now I went and stood on my head and looked upside down with a flashlight through my own amplifier that I have in my, my truck. And if you've seen how I had it mounted, I might insert a picture here. I literally had to go and lay on the center console and stand on my head with a flashlight. It was, and I thought I got the right resistor value. This, what I put in here is wrong. It's wrong. How do we know it's wrong? Because I woke up the internet. I went out and I found every single car audio thread that I could lay my hands on that was associated with the repair of one of these and said, does anybody have a service manual? And it was like crickets. Chirp, chirp, chirp. Well, the internet's a powerful thing. I'm not gonna lie. I logged on to Facebook one day and I never, ever, ever, do I never, ever, ever use Facebook Messenger, by the way. Don't. I was using it to harangue my friend Gary Biggs. And I wanted to get him on the phone for an interview and we talk about the history and all this stuff, but I don't think that's gonna happen. But I was bugging him because I wanna get a new back plate, new front plate, and he says he's got a whole bunch of that stuff whatever. If I get a new front and back plate from him, great. If not, I'm going to have one manufactured because this thing has to be complete because I'm probably going to end up keeping this one, even though I bought it to sell it. But if somebody offered me the right amount of money, I'd probably sell this thing in a New York second. Not like I don't have a brand new one sitting in a crate in the closet in the house. And uh, I've got another one in a truck that I don't even drive and I probably should sell the truck. I should rip everything out of that truck and sell it. It's like 40 grand worth of stereo stuff in that. And I never drive that truck. It's slowly rotten into the freaking cement floor and in closed storage. Anyhow, I was blind. But then I logged into Messenger to go around Gary Biggs, and there was this gentleman that had sent me a message that says, Hey, are you seriously looking for the service manual for an 86,000 GTI? And I went over and I messaged this guy back. And I said, Yeah, man, I would desperately like to find the service manual because I was stuck. This thing would have had to just sit here until I was able to find that data. Now, I found one thread on the internet in a certain group, which I'm not going to say which one it was to protect the innocent. But there was this dude called Dr. Zeus. And his profile picture is literally of Doc Brown from Back to the Future going, eh, you know, where he's got his. His jaw jerked way back and he's, yeah. <clears throat> Anyhow, he had been bragging, oh look, I found the service manual. Uh, I guess at one point it was on the internet and the page that it was on is now not hosted anymore. And so that data has gone. Well, I've been bugging the hell out of him. Dude, you got a copy of this thing? Do you got a copy of this thing? Crickets, once again. Well, this one gentleman, he's got himself a little YouTube channel, but the only reason that he knew I was looking is because he follows me because he's a ham. He likes ham radio stuff. I love ham radio. Well, he saw this thing come up and he got all excited because he's like, I can help him. Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> Mad Scientist Audio Guy is the name of his YouTube channel. I think he's got like six subscribers at the moment. So anyhow, he messages me out and he says, hey man, you know, I sent him back a message. I said, yeah, just, I don't use Facebook Messenger for anything. Give me a call. Phone, two seconds later. I mean, like not even two minutes later. And he goes, I'm sitting here in front of my computer. Do you want me to mail you a physical copy or do you want me to email it to you? And man, I just about jumped out of my chair. I was like, dude, email it to me. So he sent me the PDF. That's what a service manual is supposed to look like. All 61 or 67 pages worth of knowledge. And yeah, it's dual sided. It's, this is a service to beat all service manual. I printed a copy. Now, I'm gonna also say this. I don't really necessarily have the means to host it and give you a link, but I'm gonna put the business email in here if you want a copy of the service manual, email me. I will gladly send it to you. I have it backed up on my phone. I have it backed up on three different computers. Um, I've got it put on a little thumb drive of data someplace off the squirreled off in no man's land. And then if you go and you do any A6000 GTI, I went and I started a thread on the two largest audio repair forums on the Interboob and made the post literally a 6000 GTI service manual. Now the way he came across the service manual is he was able to harass the guys at Crown enough to where finally one of the techs at Crown was willing to give him the manual and they emailed it to him. Praise God is all I gotta say. It's a friggin miracle. So in here is a complete schematic draw of everything that's inside this case. Now I was a little freaked out because this board service rev that's in here is the newer model. Like what I've got in my truck and what's in the crate in the house. This, the newer model is a black board. This green board is an older rev. This is rev version seven, I do believe. Rev six, no. Yeah, rev six power supply board but after doing a lot of looking and having the voltmeter out and looking at some stuff I come to the conclusion that the parts might be in a different location but the part numbers and the values have stayed the same for the most part so this manual is the guide and hopefully hopefully this will allow us to keep more of these alive going into the future. Now that we have the service manual, we can see what our gate voltage drives are, how, what our gate voltages are, how much drive we need to put into each one of the final rail sections. And there's been quite a few conversations I've had about changing out the FETs in the final end of this thing to see if we can get more power out of it. And then of course, you know, we all have the dream of, oh, hey, we'll do all the hard lifting. We'll tell everybody how to get like another 1,000 plus watts, 2,000 watts out of their A6000, and then we'll send it over to Big D over there, or, um, Wilson Audio Labs, and have him run it on his little Mead Dino. And uh, we'll all become famous and we can eat donuts at freaking IHOP. No. <laughs> they make a better transistor for the power supply that will crush the MOSFETs that are in here. Because remember, this is like 20-year-old tech that's in here and they make a way better this these are way discontinued components the uh, final amplification FETs are at end of life because they're not lead free everything's got to be lead free now whatever stupid we could change all these FETs out over here and change these FETs out over here and we figure that we could get roughly another two to like four thousand watts per channel ish depending really depending on how heavily we modify over here. But we can't modify over here without modifying here because you got a delicate balance that energy produced versus energy utilized to produce other energy. Um, got some really smart people helping me on this and I'm really quite grateful for everybody jumping in. I think it's kick ass that everybody wants to get on board and help me with this. So I think it's fun to watch all the energy that has come from this as well. Quite a few comments. Oh man, 30 minute talk show, two minute repair. Hey, but at the end of the day, everybody's got the service manual now, right? Okay. 
Let's jump over here. I, I want to go over to the computer screen here real quick. So if we open up the service manual, we'll find on the service manual, we're going to go and look at print 134174-14. Let's zoom on in here a little bit. So we can start looking at this and we can start seeing the circuit breakout. This is the just the indicator light. This is the entire circuit for the indicator light. And this is a drive module for something and this is a clock and over here we're going to have our power supply temp 1, temp 2. These are our sensors. These are the actual sensors that allow us to do anything. Temp number 3. But in here this is where this gets really, really, really fun. The first thing we have to tackle is right here. The battery over voltage, negative battery over voltage, or under voltage and over voltage, okay? This is where in lies the cruxes. If I wanted to put this, let's say, in a current modern 16 volt, you know, LTO powered environment. You cannot, after looking at the service manual, you determine you cannot without doing some modification to the um, power supply system itself in this vehicle, you can't, or in this amp, we cannot go over like 16.2 volts without us starting to possibly run into the problem of whacking out some other components up chain in the amplifier world. But this resistor right here, let's zoom in a little bit, make it easier for you all that are looking at this on an iPhone owner. This resistor right here, R115, it's a 1K. This is where we're getting our voltage reference. I was kind of fixated on this R128, but then it dawned on me that this is our drive voltage for this circuit. Okay, overvolt, this is what trips the light, which is a whole other section, which is down on another print, the whole light circuit. We're not concerned about that. What we're looking for is the differentiating drive circuit. So it's looking for a differential voltage, voltage here and if this gets too far out of spec, the reference voltage, it'll trip this and activate the light. So now we know that we've got to go look for R115. This is our trim resistor from our reference voltage. Okay. We found R122. I found all of these resistors and they are scattered to holy hell. It's really weird. They're all kind of clustered around one spot, but then you got another resistor that's way off on the other side of the, on the circuit. So let's take a second and let's fade back over to the main camera. So now we're over here. I want to know what this horse shit's all about. This bugs me. This, this really, this bugs me a lot. This right here. Now, as we can all clearly see, in all unadulterated um, 4K, we're looking for resistor 17, so R17. It's good, we'll fade back over to the computer. Now, I looked all over this print, and what I did is I started out way up here in a corner, and I actually started out three prints or two prints before this, and scoured the thing like it, I was looking on Google Earth to try and find some girl sunbathing behind their house at the pool, okay? And I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm looking. And you start to see a logic to it. It's like, you can see that, here, like here's resistor four, R4. Oh, the other thing you gotta understand here is let's go up and let's read the legend on all of these prints. It says very clearly that all resistors are labeled in ohms unless otherwise indicated. And it's all over on these prints. So when we look and we see R, and then we're showed by a number, let's say here R142, that's zero. Not zero K, it's zero ohms unless otherwise indicated, which is 10, and everything is a K, it seems like. I've seen very few ohm things. 
we're going to come back around to that here in a minute. So anyhow, I'm scouring and I'm scouring and I'm scouring and I'm looking and I'm like, where in the hell is this resistor? I'd spent a little bit of time looking here, but I never bothered to wander over and look here. R117 is a 7.87K resistor, which is a very odd number. And then we've got a 100, but C112. But it's showing that these two are jumper together. Well, when I go and I look at it on the board, yeah, it's 120 puff capacitor or 120 UF electrolytic, but there's no inductor shown. So I'm not a little bit too sure what they're doing there. But this is tied into our current limiter and our crowbar circuit. I don't know. I'm going to run with the fact that it's there and it's doing its thing. Hopefully I never have to use the current limiter or the crowbar setup. It's really cool. Um, in the service manual, up, way up, way, way, way up at the top. They, showed a, they tell you how to align and set up the crowbar circuitry sense, which they literally have you short out the terminals on the output. And they literally have you short out shit in reverse. It's wild. Like, no way would anybody set it up like that today. But for the moment, I want to check this out. So I find R115, which, believe it or not, is directly located next to and behind the capacitor and the inductor that they have cobbled together in here. And let's fade back over to the big camera. R115 is right here. Here's R122, but R115 is right here, that little resistor. That is our reference voltage, which controls our circuit. So I go and I probe it, ping, ping, and it's supposed to be 1K. The tolerance of this resistor is such that it is 941 ohms. Hence the reason why it's tripping at 15.4, 15.3 volts. So we got to push that up a little bit. Now I don't like surface mount chips. I have almost no surface mount technology in this shop. But what I do happen to have is really, really, really small resistors that we'll be able to make hook up on those solder pads. You bet yourself some money that I'm going to go find myself a 1.1K And we're gonna modify this thing so I can run it up to at 16 volts, but not farther. And even if I got a cobble and a trimmer in here, I'm making it happen. So, and then once we get that done, we're gonna come over here and we're gonna decombobulate this mess right here. Okay, <clears throat> so we've gone in, we've yarded out the 900 ohm resistor. We put it right down here. There's a little piece of black tape. We put it down here to hold onto it. You know, and I, I had one of these all those years. I never knew that there was the network light which were blue. That's really cool. Anyhow, um, we've gone in here and we've yarded that out, and we've got a 1.1k, 1% 1 .1 tolerance resistor put in its place. So. Here's where we're running into a problem. Is uh, before we would run this up and it would get to about 15.1 volts and it'd become unstable and shut down. So right now we've got 12.64 volts. The reason we're, we're bypassing this circuit over here is because the tents matter. The tents' lives matter. Okay. Let's go ahead and start running this up. Now, 
we got a couple thousand ferrets worth of storage going on here. And we're going to take this up to 15.1 and just let it pause for a minute. We're going to watch our amp load over here. When this thing goes to trip and overfault, this amp load will drop down to about five or six amps. So let's get down here. I got to adjust this very finely. We're going to take it on to 14.4 or 15.4 volts. Bloop. And it just went into overvolt. Okay. It's technically faulted. The amplifier shut down. So we'll go ahead and we'll pull the voltage off. And now it's going to try and turn on and recycle itself. Now technically the power supply is turned back on. I dare not cycle this until I get below 15 volts. There. If I would have cycled it, I would have gotten limit protect and battery overvolt. Just like what just happened. See this here? At 14.87 volts. So I'll let it cycle on down a little bit further. Still battery overvolt. Battery overvolt. Battery overvolt. Fourteen volts on the supply. We're waiting for the super caps to bleed down. Okay, battery overvolt is cleared. There. Now we're back running full chooch. I don't know. I want to know what this is all about. To be honest with you, I'm going to disconnect the supply completely. Pull it down to something negligible. I want to bypass that and see if this thing turns on. Okay, you guys ready to rock and roll? I'm ready to rock and roll. Let's zoom in here first off and let's start off here. This whole section has been thoroughly tested and repaired. This gobbledygook bullshit does not need to be in there. This capacitor and this resistor. That is a 14K. 14.7k ohm resistor and it's got a 100 oh, what is this pile of shit here 100 uf 16 volt electrolytic now if we go over and we look at the service dock it's going to tell us that that needs to be a 7.87k resistor it needs to be a minimum of 12 volts and then the capacitor is present the capacitor is c112 so C112, but well, guess what? C112 is in there. It's just over there. <laughs> so we don't need to add that cap here. The 14K, 14.7K, I don't know why that that was ever even put in there. So this is a 1%, 7.85. That's close enough for me. So 7.85 instead of 7.87K. This is a 1K resistor that we replaced. That resistor was out of tolerance, by the way. It was at 900 ohms. Now, let's go over here. This resistor, which I'm watching it with the FLIR, this one here, is also a 1K resistor. So we replace that with a 1% or a 2% 1K resistor which I think, I want to line the FLIR up just right. 
I think that's going to allow us to be within tolerance. All right. So all of those things have now been fixed. Oh, um, this thing here, this inductor that the top was cracked off, I had one of the YouTube guys say something to me about it. It is a 10 Unihenry um, inductor choke. Well, I floated it off the board. I hooked it up to my inductance meter and it reads 10.6 Unihenrys. So it is still within spec. The only thing that happened is on this inductor, there's a little tiny part of the ferrite lid got chipped off. It is still well within a 10% tolerance window. I mean, it's like, not even 10%, it's like, what, one, 2% off? So I'm gonna disregard this for now. I do have this part coming in the mail. And before it leaves here, that thing will be replaced. But for today's sake of conversation, this amplifier is 99.9999% done. The 1% that is left is maybe change out that inductor and the broken fluorescent tube. The fluorescent tube is on its way. Now, the tube, if we put it on the inside of the cage, come to find out, this is stuff I've learned from other people today. The fluorescent backlighting tube that they used on these things, they had one that was on the inside of the cage over here and one that's on the outside. The one that I had, the original old school one, the, the tube was on the inside. They discovered that if that tube, if the ballast wasn't in the right place on the RF shield, it would muck with some of the driver section over here. So then they took and they put it on the outside, the tube. They put the tube on the outside. I don't know why, the ballast is what makes all the noise. Anywho, that was their logic. So, to cover it all up, to revamp back over everything, that's fixed, that's fixed, and that is fixed. So every little thing that's in here that could have had a problem is now happy. Okay, let me cycle everything here. Zero the DC clamp. We're going to set it up for max. What is this thing that's tripping? It's beeping at me. I need to get me a new one of these. Okay. Flares up and running. Now, for being able to overclock this thing, that is a no go. And I'm going to explain to you and show you why here in just a second. So this is our, we're looking at the negative side of the output section rail bus off the board. That's shown over here on this meter. There's currently a hundred or eight, pardon me, not a hundred, eight volts and dropping because there's a bleeder resistor that's attached to this bank to help keep you safe. Anytime that you have a high voltage section like this, you want to be able to neutralize it within a reasonable amount of time to keep us, AE, the end user that likes to stick our meat paws and everything, safe. This meter is showing us our input voltage. So in theory, this meter is showing our output voltage out of the power supply. Let me show you what happens when we power this thing up and what happens when we run the voltage up and down and show you why just simply changing this resistor is never going to make it so that we can overclock this thing to 16 volts. It's just never going to happen. Okay. Amplifier off. That is our remote switch. Let's go ahead and... So that pulled... There's no way that number is right. Ain't no way. And rush blank. Zero. There are sometimes I turn this thing on and it is so violent that these lines move and I've been trying to catch that so I could say, oh look at all the amperage it, it pulls. <laughs> that was so much it knocked the lines off. Yeah, 
Here we go. It did it. Just the initial turn on voltage. That inrush current. I finally caught it on video. 485 point. Yeah. Flip the switch and this thing powered up and the caps all charged and this all charged up. 485 amps to turn it on. <laughs> okay. Please note our line voltage here. Up we go. Okay. Everything is on and then boom, we're looking here. 12 and a half amps. It's perfect. That's perfect. That's perfect. What we're looking at here is we've got our crosshairs on our FLIR zoomed in on this resistor. It's marked, I mean, it is deadly sniper, sniper haired right on that one resistor. So you guys can see it better than me. It's got 121 degrees, which is perfect. It's perfect. It's got the right amount of voltage drop across it. Figure this out because of the service manual. So now we're sitting here and we're floating. 152 volts negative. So that means we have 152 volts positive. Total of 304 volts present. And that is at 12.78 volts. Let's turn the power supply on. I've got it set up to max crest out at 15.4 volts. We're not gonna get there though. So let's watch what happens over here with this voltage. And then over here, look what's happened. We're already up 30 volts. 15.3. So now, 15.4, oop, power supply just kicked out. It says, no, 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 we're getting too high. What's actually causing this circuit to trip out over here is this voltage, this rail voltage, is too high. Okay, so we had 300 volts when we first turned it on. So what is 186 times two, right? So let's go look at that. 186 times two, 372 volts. We have a maximum of 400 volts on the capacitors. But internally, on the amp section, it says, nope, too close. And it's really, we're getting right to the edge of the sun where we're gonna catch ourselves on fire. So remember, the day and age when this thing was built, it was designed to run around an AGM system. Okay, my LTO system that runs, well, right at the ragged edge of 16 volts. Mm. This tells all. This circuit doesn't fall into fault until we cycle the amp off at that high voltage and bring it back online. When we cycle it back on, that's when we get the overvolt and the overcurrent. It's showing us multiple things, that this thing is pulling too much current and it's too much voltage going in it. Remember, power supply, amp rail. So when we recycle the amp at 15 volts or under, everything's happy because it is. This thing is not sending a fault signal back this direction, nor should it have to. It cuts itself off and what it does is it goes into a weight reset cycle. When we run it up, watch what happens. We'll run our voltage back up. We're going to watch our voltage over here climb and climb and climb and climb. When we get up to about 13 or 15.5 or 15.3, 15.4, we're going to see our amps drop off. Boom, amps just dropped off. Let's kill the power supply and let the voltage roll back down again. This is protecting itself. Power supply unloads now it says, oh, the voltage has dropped low enough and it turns itself back on. And we're still in the safe run mode. No signals coming back. Amplifier is totally happy over here. This is totally happy over here. The only time that this would pick up on it is when we cycle the amplifier off. See, we're over 15 volts. It wants that start voltage to be below 15 volts. So I'm gonna move on down, mosey on down, roll it on up to the east side, still around 120 degrees. 
gets up to about 150, 160, it just sits there over here. Now we're safe. Because tenths of volts matter. Tenths of a volt matter. Well, we've been sitting here for about, how long have we been on the phone now, Zane? This, since the last segment I shot in this one, about 10 minutes? Yeah. So I've just been sitting here watching this resistor cook and it's sitting at 160, 159 to 169 degrees. So it's well within operating spec. It'll sit like that forever. So as you can clearly see, it's about 75 degrees, 78 degrees in here at the moment. <clears throat> so I think it's time for me to start putting this thing back together. I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired of having all these little body pieces laying all over the damn place. So it's time to put the end caps on. It's time to start putting the cage back together. It's time. It's time. It's time. No, it's uh, not in slow-mo. This is real time. That's the amp doing its thing. So what we've got here is a Series 1 Crown or a JBL GTI 15. And then we've got the Series 1 Mark II 15. This is a brand new one. That's a brand new one that I had sitting in storage. And we're sitting here, we're just running the speakers at 5 hertz. Now the frequency cutoff for the amplifier is at, if I'm not mistaken, like 32 hertz or something, at least the low pass filter is. We have the low pass sitting at 100 hertz right now. We're currently consuming 3.9 amps at about 13 volts. And the whole point is to just watch all the components that we've repaired and make sure that we're up to snuff. We're not here to actually bump any really big bass because guess what? They're free air and we're going to be jiggling shit in this room here in a minute. So let's come on up here to about 10 hertz. That's eight. There's nine. There's 10 hertz. So remember, this is an RMS meter, and so is this. So you guys can do your math and figure out your equations as you want as we go. Now I know every speaker's got its own efficiency level. We're running on 12 volts at the moment, and this is our amperage consumption right here. For 10 and 11 volts. You know what? Ugh, that's not safe. Let's do this. We'll sit at about 14. So we'll let the caps zip up. This is really hard what we're doing for the amp to do and maintain this low of a frequency. So right now, <clears throat> in RMS power, making the assumption, which I know is not correct, that the speaker is at 100% efficiency. So we're doing 26 volts, 26.81 times 5.5 so we're only producing about 147 watts per channel roughly so we times that by 2.2 to get our peak power numbers but that's us assuming that the speaker is 100 percent efficient which it's not so let's go ahead and we'll turn our gain down a little bit we'll come on up here to about 30 or 40 hertz we'll come up to 30 hertz even Let's run our gain up a little bit. Turn that back down. We're going to run our input signal up a little bit. So we've seen it pull a couple hundred amps here. I wasn't looking at the voltage number over here. Hey David, come keep an eye on this voltage number and tell me what you see it peak to. We're gonna look right at that digit, okay? We're joined by my friend David Mackey today. He's just kind of hanging out with me. Fifteen something. Okay. 
15 something. That's an average. That's an accurate number. 15 Whoa. something. I was 525 watts per channel at 100% efficiency, which I know that that's not the actual equation, so. It's cool, isn't it, David? Yes. So let's come on up here a little bit to like, let's say 40 hertz. Sixty four at about twenty amps. Let's give the speaker coils a second. Yep. That was twelve hundred watts per channel, roughly. <clears throat> and we'll come a little bit higher. We'll come up to 50 hertz. Saw 100 there at 73 amps. That can't be right. I had to have been reading it wrong. Okay, so 100 at 20. Which is not bad. That's 2,000 watts per channel at 100% efficiency, which we're not. And I'm over here looking. I'm going to take a FLIR shot, and what we're looking at is down in here. So we're looking down at that pathway that we repaired. Now we're going to look over here. Look at this resistor. Then, of course, buried down underneath here, our over volt, over temp, all that stuff that we've repaired is perfectly happy. So, me personally, I think it's cool as frig to see a one hertz tone. It's the speakers moving at one hertz. That's two hertz. Went into protect and fault. Good crowbar protection. Okay, let's turn the amp off. Back on. Nope. Popped it again. So we're not liking these lower tones. So we'll come back up to 10 hertz. We're going to turn the volume down on the input signal here. That's 10 hertz. Out there for a second, David. I thought I might have blown a speaker. Let's turn our game back down. There's some elephant in Africa right now going, oh my god, my ears, turn it down, turn it down. That neat to watch love it so the moral of the story is I think we got her I think it is pretty much as repaired as we're gonna be able to make it the test equipment we have available to it now I got to tell you last night I had everything hooked up to this thing oscilloscope freaking inductor meter 
resistor potentiometer, I had it all hooked up. I'm tickled. I am tickled. It's the temperature of the, mo the, the coils here. That one's at 88. That one's at 88.2. Well, I'm going to take this and I'm going to consider it a win. But first off, before I run away, let's do this. Let's go up here high. Let's go to like 60 hertz. So what we're dumping in is the same signal that you would be putting into your wall to power your house, right? So we're putting in 22 volts at 60 hertz. It's coming out as about five amps RMS. Hey, we finally got the cooling fans on the amp to kick on. Back in the gain down out of the amplifier. Free air, no distortion, 96, 96 volts. What was that about a of 15 amps, give or take. I'm happy. I'm impressed. And I'm going to quit before I burn up my speakers. My incredibly expensive, very rare, incredibly expensive, very rare speakers. So did you ever have that one friend in high school that, or maybe later in life, like in college or whatever, and I didn't care what it was, you know, oh, I got a fire truck. Or, you know, you go and say, hey, you know, my uncle's got a fire truck. And he'd be like, your buddy, oh, yeah, my granddad's got a fire truck and it's, the baddest of the bad of the bad and well I've got five of those and you've got one and I've got one of these and you got none and hate that guy fucking hate that guy I ain't that guy so after really getting to talk to some people in the know this one here is a production amplifier this one here is a pre-production amplifier and what they did with a lot of the pre-production amps is they took those parts and put them together and they let them go out to the stores as vendor test samples to go sit on the floor if not for resale. And I am convinced that this is a vendor pre-production unit, this one here. Because the board demographic is different, although the part numbers are the same. This is um, the one that I had in the house in the crate, right, up in the house in storage. So I went over to go look at the one that was in my truck and I was like, oh man, I'm not, I had like friggin' trying to pick this thing up out of the back. When I put this in the back seat of my truck, my SPL truck, there's no seats in it. There's seats in it now and I'm going, I'm not, no. So when I dug this one out of the crate, it's just been chilling, nilling. Um, one of these two I'm gonna get rid of at some point or another because I don't need three of these things. I just don't. This is a pre-production one. This is, to me, cool is cool. That's really cool, but this is cool as cool gets. So, But we are here to finally start putting this back together because now I've got all the little parts in play that I need. This was a test of patience to find these. These are made by Toucan. Mini neon rods, baby. I found this on eBay and I paid, I think, $12 or $15 for that set of tubes. Why did I need the little mini Tucon tubes? Because the little mini Tucon tube over here is blown out. Now this is slightly different than the set that we were able to find, but I'm pretty sure we'll be able to make this work. This has a singular combined ballast for the unit. 
and that one has split ballasts. Doesn't matter, we're going to make this happen. So, that is such a pain in the ass to move, I'm not, I don't want to move it, but I probably should, because I know if I don't, it's going to slip, and then it's not going to be pristine and virginal no more. But the main reason I got it out was because of these. I had to locate these. These are the end start plates. Yep, I am deathly afraid. Come on. There we go. This end plate has got a magnetic pickup on it. This one's permanently glued in place. That means that this thing was open for everybody to look at for a long time. This thing is designed to go, and when it's on, the amp light actually power up. But I don't have these plates with this particular amp. But what I do have is spare body pieces. These spare body pieces. So if a guy was a motivated individual like I am, So you wouldn't have to have these manufactured. You now have a template and a guide. Now, is this a cut forget system here? Like, can I just go and cut this out and cut this out? Nope. There's gonna be some welding, there's gonna be some grinding, and there's gonna be a little bit of fabrication that's gonna go on with this. But I figure if I take and I eliminate this hole. So I'm going to cut it this way. Then I'll take and I'll section it here and section it here and then I'll weld this back together. Put the weld on the outside, a weld on the inside, sand it all back smooth and then recrinkle coat it. I'm pretty sure I can get it pretty close to the point where nobody's going to be able to tell that they're different. But I've got to get plates for this thing because it's got to be whole. So, now that you guys are all up to speed on what I'm thinking and where I'm at, take this, move it out of the way, take this down very carefully, and move it out of the way, and um, let's go to working on the cage with the neon tubes, because I want to start putting this back into one piece. So, this is like one of the lifetime things, you know, it's like, you, uh, you're only allowed to do so much cool shit in your life, I feel. And this is getting to own one of these and then 20 years later being in the position to where I have the opportunity to get to restore one of these. is effing cool, in my opinion. The faceplate goes on the outside, you guys. <laughs> I'm doing so much dancing around over here, my, my little black lab doesn't know which direction to turn. I keep goes and he crashes someplace and then, oh, hey man, you're in my way, get out of my way kind of thing. I spent 30 something dollars on all new hardware for the inside of this thing the other day. Because half the hardware for this cage was missing when I purchased it. Little communist bastard. <laughs> that post must be stripped. 
It decided to pop and fly out of there and go for a ride. Okay. Take it all apart. Where'd you go, little buddy? You didn't know, Dad? I'm going to fly off to the most inconvenient place to where nobody can get a hold of me. And of course, I'm made of a non-magnetic material, so you're screwed, Dad. I thought I had to take that all apart because I did little stuff like put heat shrink on the lines so they couldn't, it would never split. And <laughs> oh, I'm getting too anal about this. It's time to just get this put together. Okay, let's get you stuff down here in a corner where you're supposed to be. stuff down in your corner off that fuse the way you're supposed to be Caraway's happy everything's happy but everything's happy come here here we go you can just chill out over there Okay. Click. Okay, let's do this and not drop a screw into the unobtainium amplifier. How about we do that, dear buddy? Now, we're going to put all the body screws all the way around, and we are going to complete the Faraday cage. For lack of a better term, that's what we're going to call this thing, a Faraday cage. Now, when I purchased this, I had four, count them, four total screws holding this whole hot mess together. Well, we have now got access to all the screws. So, give me a minute. Let's see if we can do this in the dark. It's live. We got blue. Yay. We got blue, that makes me happy. Really makes me happy. And I'm finally starting to turn my bags back into empty bags. That makes me even happier. So now let's do end plates. Okay, outside pieces which are held on by very, very small screws, but two bolts. So just are, uh, they kind of give you the idea that they're held down tightly, but they're not. The main supporting points are here, obviously. So let's grab our screws and switch to that driver. And do not ever put this together with an impact driver because these are held together with the dreams of small children in third world countries. What do you mean by that? Well, these, uh, See these little grooves here? That's what these screws go into is grooves. Grooves. Yep. Thread in just like this. 
So if you take your plates off more than about, oh, I don't know, four or five times, guess what happens? Plastic stripped. Well, kind of like that one there. So we got a couple different choices. We can do a couple different things here. We can shove some tape, take these out again, shove some tape in there or cardboard or some little cheesy thing like that. Or you can just get a little bit thicker, but the exact same hardware. Make sure I grab the right. There we go. A little bit different bevel to it. Not quite what I was going to get into, so I grabbed multiple different sizes. That'll work. Let's grab a different driver. Um, on the one that is in my truck, what I ended up doing with that is I ended up putting some Velcro in here and some Velcro up here because the plate would rattle if these screws weren't like ramrod tight. And uh, I made it so that I could just reach back if I needed to adjust my phase or my power level or you know, my base boost or whatever, I could just reach back, rip the plate off. And then I had a little tiny Mac screwdriver that I had that I took electrical tape so I could do it on the fly. I mean, I had a base knob. Don't, don't get me wrong, I had the base knob. Okay, but what I did is I made it so I could, on the fly, running down the road, I had a Mac screwdriver that I had tape on it. And the only thing that would hang out of it was just enough of the tip to hit in here so I could turn change my high frequency or my low frequency or I could just flick the the slope depending on what song I wanted to listen to. I didn't believe that shit, but it's true. That's what I did. Okay. Side plates are definitely on. This one is. I think that is beautiful looking. I mean, don't misunderstand me that <clears throat> I'm going to strip this back down and we're going to redo a couple little bits of this, but I was dying. I had to see what this looked like. It's not that loud. Once you got the case on the outside, you can barely hear this thing running. Man, when you got it open, it's, <laughs> it's screaming at you. Haven't taped that down yet. Haven't quite figured out what I want to do yet. But in sharp contrast to uh, this, is the body armor that goes with it, by the way. I mean, the original OG is pretty. I mean, very pretty to me. But when you've got the one of a kind amplifier and you got a bunch of extra parts for it. Not a crime to try something new, I don't think. I'll probably end up putting this armor on my own piece of equipment. And I'll end up getting rid of this one with the stock armor on it. But This is cool. Now I want to go find myself, because we're not done yet. This is technically the end of part three, but we're not done yet. We have huge plans here. We've got some phone calls with a couple speaker companies tomorrow. We're going to see what we can have custom made for us with the smallest amount of package possible. I want to find the biggest, most power handling 10 that there is in the world. And I hear rumors that there's a 6,000 RMS, 6,000 watt RMS, nine inch, voice coiled 10 that's out there. I want to see this. I got a call in with them tomorrow and I got a couple other things. So we're not quite done. 
just yet. But we're pretty close. Pretty close. Hell, I just might build the coolest mount in the whole universe and stick them both in my truck. I don't know. God knows I got enough amperage in my truck. We'll see. Not y'all.